This is part two of lecture 13. So in the first part, we defined prejudice and we saw that there's different ways of measuring it, for example, through the IAT. In the second part of the lecture, we're going to talk about the causes and also the consequences of prejudice, because especially the consequences of prejudice, if you're part of a minority group, are huge and can be quite devastating. So let's turn to those first. So what does it mean to be part of a minority group? Well, first of all, we've already witnessed uh, some of the very uh, uh, intense and, and very negative uh, associations that people may have uh, between your group, the, part that, uh, the group that you're part of, uh, and, uh, and their uh, negative ideas. Um, and that, it's, that these stereotypes are also uh, pretty hard to change. And one reason why this is also the case is that, sadly, members of stereotyped groups, especially stereotyped minority groups, tend to show behavior that is in line with the stereotype. So, in a way, they are reinforcing their own stereotypes, uh, reluctantly. Of course, they don't want to do this, but sometimes this is just happening. And uh, they can do so, or th th this happens basically in two different ways. First of all, through a process of self-fulfilling prophecies. This is a, a, a concept that you're already familiar with, so uh, I hope uh, that makes a lot of sense to you. So let's imagine that you have uh, this idea that you're having an interaction with a person, it's a black male, and you have this idea, oh, this person is probably very violent. How will you behave towards this person? Will you be very warm? Will you be kind? No, probably you will be a bit cold, maybe a bit distant, maybe already a bit hostile towards this person. So your, your expectation, your stereotypes is affecting your behavior. And because you are behaving in a pretty hostile manner, this of course also uh, uh, influences the behavior of uh, the member of the stereotyped group. So if you're, you're approached in a very negative way in a hostile manner, this will, of course, also um, uh, make, uh, lead you to actually show behavior that is in line with this. So this is a very sad thing that, that happens a lot with members from stereotype groups. Also, if uh, people uh, have uh, an idea about your group that you're probably not so smart, then we know that teachers do not actually give the same opportunities to members from minority groups to excel in the classroom, which also affects uh, their, uh, their school performance. So self-fulfilling prophecies is one of the ways in which members of minorities, minority groups actually reinforce their own stereotype. And self-fulfilling prophecies, it's important to know, it's an interpersonal process. So it, it, it happens between people. So one person shows behavior based on expectations that evokes behavior in the minority group member. But there's also another process, and this is social identity threat. And with social identity threat, um, this means that uh, just, because, just because you know that there's a stereotypical idea about your group, you will become very self-conscious and insecure. And you will actually fail uh, just because you are so uh, threatened by this uh, this part of your social identity. So, for example, if you are part uh, of a, a minority group and you have this idea that everybody expects me to be very stupid, nobody uh, will think that I will be smart enough to take this test, you will feel threatened. You will expect uh, that others uh, think you, that you are a failure. You will stop believing in yourself and you will actually fail on tests. So uh, this is actually an intrapersonal process. So it basically means you don't need anyone else anymore. Uh, nobody's telling you uh, to behave in a certain way, but just knowing the stereotype of your group evokes behavior in yourself. So both through self-fulfilling prophecies as well as social identity threats, members of minority group show behavior that is in line with that stereotype. But what happens if you're a part of a group in which they're competing stereotypes? So this is actually the case for Asian women if they have to perform a math test. So let's imagine you're an Asian woman and you're asked to do a math test and beforehand you are basically reminded of the fact that you are a female. This, this uh, idea, this stereotype is activated. Then performance on the math test goes down, so it's worse. But what happens if you're reminded that you're part of a group of Asians? Then actually performance is better. So your performance is dependent on the stereotype that is uh, activated at that uh, moment. Um, so um, we now uh, know, and this is actually pretty sad information, that um, if you are a member from a minority group, you are very much aware of the stereotypes that are surrounding your group. And this can actually have pretty devastating consequences. And uh, you can see that in a following film clip that, that I will show you, in which uh, young children are asked to play uh, with either a white doll or a black doll. Let's see what happens. Yeah. 
In Brown v. Board of Education, the famous case that desegregated schools in the 1950s, Dr. Kenneth Clark conducted a doll test with black children. He asked them to choose between a black doll and a white doll. In most instances, the majority of the children preferred the white doll. I decided to reconduct this test as Dr. Clark did to see how we've progressed since then. Can you show me the doll that you like best or that you'd like to play with? The nice doll. And why is that the nice doll? She's white. And can you show me the doll that looks bad? Okay. And can you give and why does that look bad? Because it's black. And why do you think that's a nice doll? Because she's white. And can you give me the doll that looks like you? Fifteen out of the 21 children preferred the white doll. So now we know how unfair and hor horrible prejudice is and what a devastating consequences can have if you are part of a minority group. So let's turn to what are the key questions of this lecture. What causes us to have uh, prejudice in the first place? And this is actually also an answer to one of the questions that I raised in lecture one. So why do we peop treat people differently based on their appearance? Why do we treat people differently if they have a different skin color or a different gender or a different culture, religion, sexual preference? Where does this come from? Well, there's basically three different causes of prejudice, and I will talk to, uh, talk to you one by one uh, about them. Uh, the first is pressures to conform. It has to do with the society that we live in. Um, so if we live in a society, we tend to show normative uh, conformity. So we want to uh, behave in a way that is condoned by society. And if you live in a part of the world in which there are very strong prejudice against a certain minority group, then we tend to uh, basically imitate this. And also if you are, for example, brought up by uh, racist uh, uh, parents or grandparents, then this is something that we just simply learn, that people from minority groups are inferior to us. And we just, this is so normal to us because this is the way that we've been uh, brought up. So we, we go along with this just because we don't know better. This is how we learned. And we also know that uh, other parts of, of society also plays a big role. For example, the laws that there are in a certain area or a certain country. And just still, even though a lot of forms of discrimination are luckily no longer legal, there's still something like institutional discrimination. And you see this, for example, uh, here you see a map of the world, and you see uh, parts of the world uh, where uh, mar marrying someone from uh, the same sex is uh, still illegal and sometimes even uh, involves the death penalty if you have a relationship with someone from the same sex. That's these red areas uh, in, in the world. And this will affect our prejudice. And uh, this is also, you know, this is very alarming if we know that also in parts of the United States and also in Europe, these norms are, st are also still changing. So discrimination can sometimes even become more prevalent than, than it was a couple of years ago. And this will affect the prejudice that people will display and experience. So if, if uh, discrimination is institutionalized, you will uh, create a prejudiced society in which people judge each other based on their appearance or, their, uh, or other components of their personality. Um, so social pressures, that's the first uh, cause of uh, prejudice. The second cause of prejudice stems from something that we discussed in lecture five on the self. And in this lecture, we saw that there's different ways that we can look at ourselves, different parts of our self concept. Uh, we have our personal identity, that's our own personal qualities and, 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 and characteristics. We have our relational identity, so that's how we relate to others in our surroundings. But we also have our social identity. And social identity is that part of our identity that stems from membership, membership of certain groups. And we are all part of different groups, and they are part of who we are. 
And of course, we know that we love to have a very positive view of ourselves. And this, this is also about our social identity. So we love to um, have a very positive view of the groups that we belong to. Uh, this makes a lot of sense because it, it has consequences for how we generally feel about ourselves, for our self-esteem. Um, and this has, has several consequences. So if uh, we think about our in-group, the group of people that we identify with, that we consider those are part of us, that's part of my identity, it's really my group, then there's two different processes that take place. First of all, ethnocentrism. And ethnocentrism is the belief that your group, that can be your culture, your nation, your religion, is superior to other groups. And uh, this is basically something that we all have a little bit, but there are some groups that are very high in ethnocentricity uh, and others are, are some, something uh, uh, somewhat lower in ethnocentricity. And it's, it's quite problematic if, if uh, your culture is very high in ethnocentricity because if you really feel like my group is superior and the other groups are inferior or if sometimes even inhumane, this can of course have very uh, big consequences uh, when it comes to conflict with, uh, with minority groups. So ethnocentrism, the belief that your group is superior. And we also have this general tendency of in-group bias. And that means that, that we want to favor uh, members of our own group and give them special treatment over members that belong to other groups. So uh, we, we just are a bit more friendly towards members of our own group. Um, we, we give them the benefit of the doubt. We give them more chances and they are more likely to become our friends, which is all good and fine if you are part of a majority group. But if you're part of a minority group, you can of course suffer uh, tremendously from this because people treat you differently because you're not part of that bigger, uh, bigger in-group. So how do we generally behave towards members of other groups? Uh, well, there's basically two over, overarching things that we do. First of all, we consider members from other groups as basically all the same. This is called outgroup homogeneity effect. So you don't really see a lot of individual differences between members of the outgroup. You put them all in one pile and you say, oh, you're just a bunch of Asians. So you're all the same. So we treat them as one group and we fail to see their individual differences. So that's outgroup homogeneity. The other thing we do, and this is also an umbrella term, is outgroup derogation. And that means that we tend to blame the outgroup. We blame them for things that go wrong in our own lives. If this happens, this is called scapegoating. So for example, this is when your, your old neighbor complains to you, yes, it's all these foreigners coming into the country and they're taking my job. You know, you're blaming someone else for your misfortune. That's scapegoating. But also we tend to blame um, people from outgroups uh, for their own misfortune. So we tend to, you know, blame the victim when it comes to, our, to the outgroups. We say, well, everything that's wrong for you, you know, you're just causing it yourself. So we're very harsh on the outgroup. And this is everything to do with this social identity, that it helps us to fe feel good about ourselves, because in that way we're protecting our view of the in-group. So uh, the final explanation of prejudice is actually the most straightforward one, and this is the realistic conflict theory. And that states that sometimes, and this is of course also just facts, sometimes groups are in competition with each other for scarce resources. And this can be very serious. For example, uh, if it's about scarce uh, ground, like in Israel, the conflict between Palestine and Israel. And uh, this is a very harsh conflict. Here you see w what happens over time. So Palestine used to exist in 1947. Uh, after the partition plan, you see that parts of, of, of Palestine were sort of offered to uh, Israel to, uh, to start uh, uh, their, their country there. But over time, Palestine is basically just faded away, it's, 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 near, it's, it's nearly uh, gone already. The only part that is left is, is this, this small green part in the, in the final uh, picture, which is the Gaza Strip, which is of course still also uh, an area where, which highly uh, thought about. So um, if groups are in competition between gra over, over scarce resources such as uh, land, then it's pretty you know, obvious why they, are, why, why they don't like each other, right? It can also take more mild forms, for example, competition over, you know, a sports trophy. This can also sometimes be very hostile, by the way, but uh, this is also an example of realistic conflict. So these groups are actually in competition with each other. And um, then it's, it's understandable that they don't like each other. Um, so we've now seen all these different causes of prejudice. So we sort of understand why people 
suffer from prejudice, and especially why minority groups have to suffer from it. So in, this in the final part of the lecture, we're finally going to turn our attention to the solution. <laughs>